So, hello everybody. Uh, let me first introduce my colleague. He's, the, his name is Maciek, as you already know. He is a distinguished engineer at Cisco and he is also a, a technical project lead for the CISIT project. He is very, uh, he's very, um, Benchmarking guy, uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry. You're out of words. <laughs> I'm out of words. Yes, yes. He's very, very excited about benchmarking and uh, and really understanding how things work inside, and why the numbers are like they are. So he will help me with this session. Excellent. And um, I'm not that actually excited about benchmarking. I, I'm excited about the, you know many other things. That is not what I said. I said you are excited about how things work inside. Exactly. Um, and with me, a co-presenter is uh, Damian Marion. Uh, you might have seen him. He's one of the leading committers uh, to, um, uh, to VPP. He's our software lead who knows pretty much everything there is to know about VPP fast software data plane. He's a tinker. He used to uh, be a, 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 a core committer to FreeBSD, correct? Yes. And yeah. um, he cares about devices and how bits uh, flow and you know, also has this uh, weird virus um, that he needs to understand uh, how his code works on all sorts of different hardware. I've never seen his lab, but I've, s I've heard a lot. And, um, and there is a lot of, lots of, lots of different compute toys and networking toys in his uh, lab, I'm told. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about a Mammoth. And um, uh, we're going to talk about the context, so that's that's my uh, job. I'm going to do some you know, hands waving and 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 some charts uh, maybe, and then Damian's going to cover Mammoth, and we're going to look at uh, numbers. So the M SDN and NFV. Uh, I think the NFV uh, thing started quite a few years back, and um, a lot of people say that uh, it hasn't really delivered on the original premise of. Uh, uh, revolutionizing the uh, the telco industry uh, from the you know, virtualization perspective and uh, network services in software. Um, and I only partially agree with that view. But um, where the NFV, I believe, is these days is moving closer to the actual hardware and uh, going native, containers and cloud native. And that's where the, the network functions are, are, are uh, going into. We've done a lot of you know, uh, benchmarking and tests in the past on the network functions in VMs, and clearly the VMs and KVM uh, and the hypervisors carry uh, quite a lot of tax. So, uh, so moving moving to the uh, to the cloud native means we're going to have you know uh, many more uh, workloads, lighter workloads, native workloads that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, to give them uh, something that wasn't really possible in the VM world. It is to really take advantage of the native performance and benchmarking characteristics of the hardware, compute hardware they run on. Orchestration is moving from you know the popular uh, OpenStack and uh, hold on, I'm getting some weird messages here on the screen um, to to Kubernetes, um, uh, pods containers, the pod container networking orchestration uh, part is being addressed. So that somebody mentioned Multus earlier. Ad, Ad referred to Legato, and there is this new talk of network service mesh that started at uh, ONS ENLA that, uh, that Ed facilitated and uh, we now have a, a mailing list and, and calls and maybe something good will come from that. Uh, and that's really treating the network uh, services as a, as a real citizen, uh, as a first order citizen in, in Kubernetes, uh, but designing it in with also the Kubernetes, na Kubernetes native environment um, in, my, in mind. So what all of this is calling for uh, is uh, basically um, addressing uh, natively a packet interface uh, between uh, containers or processes um, that care about performers and ac actually equivalent of the Verti Verti Vihos user, the stuff that we have actually developed in VPP years back and Damian had the first implementation of Vihos user on VPP um, very quickly following uh, Luke Goris, if you know Luke. Um, and this also gives us an opportunity to, uh, to do it right. So the hopes I have for Mammoth and had from the moment that, uh, that the talk started was to actually come to close to what the next slide shows. And here is the, the QR code. I also got the same uh, disease as that. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, uh, the QR code goes to the video that is uh, short linked uh, here. Um, it's the FDIO uh, co-production with uh, Intel as part of the Xeon Skylake launch on the 11th of July, 2017, 
where we actually show the live demo of uh, getting the terabits uh, like speeds on the on the server. And um, an FDIO is able to a VPP code can is able to to use natively the hardware and get uh, advantage of take advantage of, of this sort of speeds. So the hopes I, I personally have and uh, and it, it is becoming a, a shared, uh, I don't know, uh, goal, Damien? <laughs> um, to, uh, to get the bare metal speed speeds, but in the virtualized or containerized environment. And Mammoth is a, a key building block. So the next slide shows really the merge of two worlds, the bare metal world and uh, the VM world, going into the containers cloud native world, where Mammoth becomes uh, this uh, virtual uh, uh, packet interface that gives us speeds we, uh, we need. And, uh, and that's Mammoth. So uh, long live Vertio vhost, but uh, actually long uh, welcome, welcome Mammoth. So with that, I give it to Damien. Thank you, Maciek. Yeah, so, so basically, the, as Maciek said, I, I, when I started doing uh, VPP coding, uh, it was uh, around four years ago, uh, I was screw I was really spending a lot of time with with uh, with vhost user I did a first implementation in VPP and one of the things which I learned from in, in a hard way is basically how to how to how to really support the that code I mean uh, you know the, the the problem the main problem when, when you are trying to do user mode uh, uh, to user mode application is that that remote guy can easily sneak you some 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 wrong data or something uh, which can easily basically uh, in, uh, make you crashing, right? And I was chasing so many the, the different use cases when, when basically the, the VM, which was, was just putting some garbage on, in the memory, and then uh, VPP, which was, uh, which was uh, basically a QM backend, was crashing just because of uh, 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 the pointer was completely bogus, right? So uh, when we come to the, also we had a lot of issue with uh, with uh, complexity from the performance side on the on the vhost user because all the different uh, cases of which, which vhost user supports in the in the ring layout, right? So you have indirect descriptors, so you can do it this way. You can have a 10 byte uh, header, you can have 12 byte header, you can do TSO, you can do GSO, and and so on and so on and so on. So so many different use cases which, which are basically are very costly from the CPU side. To, to deal with that kind of, of, of uh, packet rings, because every single branch costs, right? So um, then, uh, of course, uh, another motivation was really that we had a, we realized that that more and more people are looking to the, the container networking and uh, and that we are actually missing some interface which is pretty much equivalent to what we host user is doing, but only for containers. Basically, with, uh, the end containers are just the user mode processes, basically. So, so that it was basically a, a roughly a motivation why I started looking to this direction. And then, um, before I started even doing any kind of coding, I was really thinking how to to do the the how to take the the security for that stuff, right? And for me, doing that, the, the number one thing which I was always uh, thinking about is uh, is about security and safety, right? So basically, uh, preventing the the uh, unprivileged uh, uh, tenant on the computer to really crash the the vSwitch, and and basically to provide kind of uh, reasonable authentication, so we can prevent uh, guys which are not allowed to to connect to to really connect and and that kind of thing. So so. Uh, so basically, the, the basic concept in, in, in MEMIF is, is about uh, defining the two sides of the communication channel. One side is, is, is master, another one is slave. And master is the guy who is considered as a safe. He is a vSwitch. Typically, the, the, the vSwitch in MEMIF deployments is a master. So to avoid uh, that guy to really to be impacted by, by the, any client or any tenant on the system, he don't. He he should not expose anything to the clients, right? So that was the b basic uh, principle of of MIF. The master never expose anything to the client. So you you can find some different similar technologies, which uh, and I was receiving quite a lot of questions about why you're not doing zero copy like DPDK is doing with with. Uh, RT ring and and primary secondary process. This is not the same problem uh, to solve, right? Uh, 
zero copy in in the in the DPDK RT ring uh, case is is completely zero copied. One guy is really owning the buffers, but everybody else can write to the, those buffers. If one guy crashes, everything is down. So what I try to do with MMIF is basically introduce the the the, the security model and then uh, and then exposing the the basically making the client to expose his resources and that is mainly the shared memory to the master. And implication of that is basically the, the fact that, that at the end uh, we, we, we cannot basically avoid that single mem copy. A um, few other, few other uh, motivations for, for doing MemIF like uh, it is today is uh, beside, um, another thing which, which was one of the goals on the, on the MemIF side was really to make the, the whole interface not really VPP specific. So uh, MemIF is defined as a, as a very lightweight protocol, but it, can, it is implemented in VPP, but even we are doing a, a small library which is, which is completely independent of the VPP code. So if you want to build a third party application in, 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 uh, which is using MemIF, you can do that without even using VPP as a vSwitch or, or component in the system. Uh, another another requirement was to basically support the both interrupt and polling mode and easily switch between them without shutting down the interface. Uh, use cases, you know, at some point you can have a lot of traffic on the specific interface, and at another point you 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 can have just few packets per second, so you should be able to switch between them. And that is also one of the things we, which is covered in the MEMIF. So basically, we can dynamically s switch between the interrupt mode and polling mode. Each side, and that, that, that can be done on the per queue basis, so every, uh, each side can decide for a specific queue if he wants to get interrupts about the new data on the ring or not. Uh, uh, another thing is that in, with MemIF, in some cases, we, we like to, to, to deal with Ethernet frames, right? So Ethernet can, is very common, people are doing Ethernet and so on. But sometimes Ethernet is a bit not really needed in some some cases, and actually that uh, adds additional complexity, because you need to do address resolution on the internet. So MemIF was from day one made in in the way that it can support both uh, Ethernet as a, as a, as a, as a protocol or transport, or it can do a purely L3 IP. So uh, as a part of the MemIF negotiation, you can basically negotiate the the, the Ethernet communication on or MemIF or or IP uh, communication, and finally. Uh, that can be extended to some different use cases. Um, I had a few of them on, on my mind, like Pant Inject Path, which is very specific, but uh, or maybe it's even the crypto acceleration over MemIF, which will basically allow uh, one guy to, to send packets to another guy to do a hardware acceleration of the crypto and then getting the packets back. So that kind of things can be done in MemIF because the, the whole protocol is very simple and very um, flexible in, in, in for such, such cases. Just a sec. Yeah. So the Ethernet IP, just to get into your, your head, small packet, 64 bytes Ethernet frame size that we usually people, people test, which is the minimum Ethernet size per IEEE. In IPv4, that will be 46 bytes. So we're saving 18 bytes. We're saving like one, more than, yeah, more than a quarter of the, of the, of the, of, of the bits. And um, uh, that's one. And second, we ask for performance, and instead uh, we are we getting uh, we getting this. So performance wasn't your primary no. priority. No, no. I mean, the interface should be as fast as possible, but the, but mainly the the main goal, the primary goal, for MMIF from the day one was about making something secure, in the way like uh, Dave Warak like, likes to say, you you can run the pe Coke and Pepsi, Pepsi on the same on the same com uh, computer, right? So you should, your VSwitch should be able to, to have packets belonging to Coke and packets belonging to Pepsi. Forward them without having any security implications between them. Are right? you sure this is possible? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so basically, that was more or less the motivation. Um, I'm just looking if I missed something because this slide is quite loaded. Um, yeah, pretty much I did everything. Uh, so. Uh, I think I already discovered some parts of, of this one. So what is MemIF? MemIF is basically an um, uh, uh, interface between two user mode processes where, the, 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 where there is a communication channel, which is used for establishing the, the interface connection. And as a part of this communication uh, con control channel, we are basically negotiating some parameters of the, of the interface, and then we are exchanging the, the file descriptors which belong to the memory regions. 
And finally, we are exchanging file descriptors which belongs to the interrupts, which we are sending across the two sides of the MIF pro uh, uh, connection. So, uh, so uh, the, the basically, the, the master is the guy who listens to the Unix socket. Unix socket is basically a base for the control channel connection. Unix, so Unix socket is created by the master. Master, lis master, master listens on the socket, and it receives the connection from the, from the slave. Uh, slave in the, uh, and then they exchange a number of messages. On the second slide, I, I, I have a bit more details of, of, about all the messages which are exchanged over this control channel. But at the end, the result of this, uh, this communication over the, the control channel is that they both have the same memory regions mapped in the memory with MAP. And they also have the information where the packet rings are in that memory. So to establish the, the MEMIF connection, the, 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 the slave needs to, to send at least one memory region to a master. It can be more, but that at least one needs to be there. And then master also needs to send, to send the, the offset of the at least one transmitter ring and at least uh, one receiver ring. In MEMIF, I'm calling them uh, M2S and S2M rings because, you know, when you are talking about RX, TX, on one side it's RX, on another one is TX, so it's a bit confusing. So I decided not to use the TX and RX. I use the M2S and S2M. So uh, the important thing, and that was referring to my, my previous point uh, about the pointers, MEMIF is never using the pointers. So all the data structures, which are actually quite simple, are using the, 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 the region plus offset pair. So when you are negotiating the, the, the protocol, you first get the, the, at least one memory region, and then you are basically saying in the next, mes next message, the, the receiver ring is, is at offset 300 in region zero. And transmit ring is, is offset 600 in the, in the region. It's much easier to, to verify that that offset is inside the memory region and that you are not causing the remote guy to sec fold because of the, the, of the false pointer than if you need to check every single pointer, right? Another, another nice thing with, 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 with offset is that when you are M mapping the, the, the memory region, you don't need to care about the same address, right? It can be completely different uh, virtual address on one side and on the other side. So um, basically, in MMF, we never do pointers. We always do uh, uh, off, uh, region plus offset. And we use that also for defining where the ring is and also where the packet buffers are in the memory. Um, then another nice parameter of the whole story is because we have this control channel between master and slave, we can do authentication. So basically, slave is uh, supposed to identify himself by using the shared secret. And also, the, the, we, we are notified when, when a slave disappears or, of, or if master disappears, right? So basically, uh, at the moment when the remote guy disappears, you will get notification that, that the socket con uh, connection is locked, lost. And you can basically clean up the memory and remove everything from the memory. So at the moment when interface goes down in MIF, everything is cleaned up. We are not keeping any shared memory. Uh, mapped after, after that event. And also we can use some facilities from the, from the kernel side to identify the user who is connecting to, to, to us by basically knowing what is the user, user ID and uh, process ID of the, of the guy on the remote side of the, of the socket. Uh, a bit more about uh, control channel. It's a basically... Uh, so we have a master slave. Everything starts with, with hello message. So basically, uh, what is missing is on this one, because it's actually not a message, it's basic connection. So slave connects to the master by using the Unix socket. Uh, master immediately sends hello message, basically saying, OK, I'm, I'm the master. I'm, the, I'm, running, I'm supporting a MemIF version 1 to MemIF version 5. Um, this, I, can, I can support up to X receive queues. I can support up to Y uh, transmit queues and a few other details. So that is the, the first hello message which is sent by master to the slave. Everybody who tries to, just, just opening the, the socket connection to that Unix socket will basically initiate this first message to, to arrive to the slave. And then slave, what slave needs to do? It needs to basically send init message where slave says, okay, I would like to initialize the, the MemIF interface ID and then uh, unique identifier of the interface. And optionally, that can be also a short secret in that message. So if you want to do authentication between the slave and the master, you just uh, the, you, you, you need uh, you can enforce on the master si side uh, shared secret, 
and then master, if he master does, doesn't get the, the correct uh, shared secret on over the channel, it will just close the socket. So basically, you're authenticating the, the, the slave to connect on the specific uh, MMIF interface. Interface ID is used here because I didn't want to have the one unique socket per, per interface. It is uh, from the provisioning side, it's a, it's a, it's, it will be a hassle to, to really orchestrate every single interface as a new file on the file system. So basically, MMIF master can have one can have one or more listeners, but each listen, listener can, can uh, accept many connections on, on, on the single uh, on the, si on, on the single, single Unix socket. Um, after we are done with initialization, uh, the, f the next message is add region, where basically the the master is uh, slave is, is exposing shared memory to the master, always in that direction. So it can be it, it needs to be at least one region. It can be more. For example, today in, in VPP implementation, we are sharing uh, one region for inks, and then we have one region per, per buffer pool. So typically, if you are running two NUMA system with, two bu to be with buffer pools per NUMA, we are typically doing uh, three, three regions uh, in VPP today. But this is purely a decision on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the slave side to decide how many regions he wants to expose. It can be everything in one. After we are done, done with add regions, so we, we can have actually have the multiple add region messages. Every region, region is, 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 every message is handling information about one on one region. And inside that message, we are basically using the, 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 uni, the Linux um, uh, ancillary data to pass the file descriptor over the communication channel. So the master basically receives the file descriptor and he can use the MMAP uh, system call on that file descriptor to map the shared memory. Uh, after that one is done, uh, we are getting. We have basically ACK message, which is, which is acknowledged that the message is received. So after all the add regions uh, messages, we have the add ring, which is a message which basically says, "I have the, the I'm, I'm now announcing the, the packet ring, and that packet ring sits in region zero at offset 300." So that is basically the purpose of this message. For every single receiver ring and for every single transmit ring, we, we are sending this message message once. And another parameter inside that message is actually a file descriptor of the event FD, which is used to for no in sending interrupts uh, to remote side. So if you are running in interrupt mode, if you don't want to pull, the, the guy who is putting stuff on the ring is basically using uh, event FD to, to notify remote guy that something new is sitting on the ring. So that is the add ring message. Of course, every time when, uh, when message is sent, the ACK needs to, to come back. And then finally, we have connect connected. After connected, the, the MMIF uh, session is established. Yes, Jerome. Like. Yes, some, some stuff is already there in, in those messages. His question? I, I couldn't hear the question, yeah. and we've got the other mic up there. Do you mind repeating it for the rest of the audience? So the question is, if the, is there any metadata shared between the, uh, in, inside those messages? Yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. Can you I need to open the source file. I mean, I don't have it here, so. <laughs> okay. Is there anything you are interested in specific, specifically, Jerome? Yeah. Yes, to understand, uh, yes, uh, Yeah, so one, 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 one metadata which is currently there, it's not uh, currently used. I mean, it's a metadata. It, it basically, it's, it's one, one part of the message is saying how many bytes each packet uh, have of metadata in the, in the head of the packet. So you, you can, over the MMF, you can negotiate that first 64 bytes of each packet is actually metadata. And that is also negotiable over the control channel. But then later, when you are processing the packet rings, you, you basically need to understand that this, this first 64 bytes are not really the packet. They are, they are just a metadata of the, for the specific packet. But, but the idea of the control channel is just to establish the parameters, exchange the parameters between the two ends. We are not using the, the, the control channel for any kind of any, any transfer of data between the, the, uh, the, those two guys. Yeah. 
No, no, th th this is purely just as about establishing connection. Uh, I mean, the protocol can be extended because all those messages have the, the unique IDs and you can easily add more messages in the protocol which are carrying some additional data. You, can just, you just need to bump the, the, the protocol version and uh, that will work. But right now, this is basically what we have. And this is a, a bit of drawing, how it, that looks like. So we have the on, on, on the bottom of the page, there is a Unix socket connection. Uh, we have a master on the left, slave on the right. And then it's basically multiple share, share memory regions. On this drawing, we have one which contains the, the packet rings and, and, and packet buffers, and then two additional regions which are, which are basically holding just the packet buffers, right? But in MemIF, this is completely flexible, so there is no limitation that, that the ring needs to be in, in uh, region zero. It can be in region one, it can be in region two, and so on, right? The, the whole point is that the that slave is allocating the memory and then exposing a bit of his memory to the master, and then master can basically read the... Uh, no, we have two, basically two, two deployment models in MemIF, right? One is single, um, single memory copy, another one is, is, is uh, memory copy twice. If, if in typical case, if you are considering master to be a safe instance, that guy is not going to expose anything. He's not exposing his packet buffers, he's not exposing any kind of information to the, to the slave. But typically, the slave is exposing stuff to the master. In that case, what you can easily do, and that will basically mean just one mem copy with the packet with data, is to, to basically share the, 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 your packet buffers to the, to the master. And then master can, can read directly from the, from the, from the, from the slave bu uh, buffers into his um, buffer memory and then send the packet out of the, of the system. Do you have metadata then in that situation? Yes. We need to, uh, the, the guy who is allocating, so in, in MemIF, uh, the, the, we have the, the rings in both directions, but the important thing to, to mention is that, uh, that the slave is always producer of the, the rings in both directions. So in the, in the transmit side, a slave is putting the, 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 the buffer to the ring and sending to the master. In the receive side, slave is putting empty buffer to the ring giving it to the master, master puts the data into the buffer, and then he gives the buffer back to the, to, the, to the slave. So there is no, it's asymmetric. It's not symmetric in the way that the, the guy who is transmitting is producing the rings. Yes. Yeah, the descriptive ring. Packet, packet is for us just a pointer. Uh, actually, it's not a pointer. It's it's a region plus offset, and length somewhere in the in the in in, in memory region. Five. It was it was five a couple minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the blinky Flo here. Flo uh, Florence, time's stop asking questions. <laughs> yeah. And okay, let me do just this one very quickly. Uh, this one just this this display the, 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 it explains the memory layout. Uh, let me just talk about Descriptor. So Descriptor is a, just a 16-byte data structure. It contains flags, region index, offset of the, bu of, the, of the buffer in the memory, length, and four additional bytes are here for metadata. If you need more than four bytes of the metadata, you need to do that as a part of the... Of the, uh, of the so the idea is, if you need just a small inf part of the, of the information in inside, the, you can keep that in, in the ring. If you want more, then you need to use the, the, the stuff I mentioned before to basically allocate the more metadata uh, for every single packet. So this is about the, the buffer descriptor. Uh, we are doing typically uh, 1,024 uh, packets per, per ring, but you can change this as long as it is power of two, it, it is fine. Uh, for performance reasons, uh, I didn't want to add uh, option for every single ring size because that is more costly to process in the in the in the code. And then finally, uh, a bit of numbers, a bit of bit <coughs> on the top. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so what we did is basically uh, last week uh, we tried to do uh, the performance uh, performance measurement for the latest code in in master using the, this topology, which is basically a typical, uh, uh, let's say, multi-tenant uh, situation when you have the, the big green one, which is, uh, is uh, vSwitch or vRouter, and then a client, client, uh, client application, which is running inside the container, and on another side, there is a 
multiple NICs. And numbers are basically, uh, uh, the, the bottleneck for this scenario is really the, the big gr green uh, guy because he's doing mem copies, right? This is the, he's the guy who is mem copying data to the container and taking the data out of the containers. And the numbers are measured on three different systems. It is in uh, Syssit Labs, where, which are using the Haswell uh, computers. So basically, uh, Xeon's, uh, you might know exactly the model number. They are here, yeah, yeah. 2699 V3, Two, this guy, 2.3 gigs. Yes. And then I capture on my, on my Skylake 8180, uh, with Turbo Boost and without Turbo Boost. And we have numbers for 64 byte packets, we have the numbers for iMix and numbers for 1518. Uh, and these numbers are actually the, uh, the, uh, the aggregate throughput of vSwitch using MemIF. So the, 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 the numbers here are really reflecting the how many data we managed to pass through the vSwitch in and out together. So with, uh, with big packets, we are at 36 gigabits per second. And then we, and when you go to the smaller, pack, uh, smaller um, packet sizes, then the, of course the, the, that is going down. But then we can also take a look at the, at the uh, PPS rate, which is for 64 uh, byte packets, so the small packets. We can do uh, almost 11 million packets per second on the, on the, I'm a bit, yeah, so yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is Skylake with Turbo Boost. Without Turbo Boost, the numbers is 8.5, and on Haswell, it's 7 uh, million packets per second. And for when we are talking about throughput, the same story, 36.5 on, uh, on Skylake with Turbo, turbo Boost, 3.8 gigahertz. This one is without Turbo Boost, 2.5 gigahertz, and this is Haswell at 2.3 gigahertz. So, so actually, you done? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So a few add-ons. Uh, the Haswell numbers are actually higher than what we have measured in uh, CISIT in this trending charts I showed earlier, because I actually extrapolated linearly uh, to the 2.5 gig uh, frequency to compare apples to apples, so it's extrapolated, uh, scaled up to 2.5 gig, and, and also uh, in, uh, in CISIT today we don't have hyper-threading enabled, so I extrapolated uh, by multiplying those numbers by 1.3, uh, which is uh, expected about 20 to 30 percent gain on HT. So those numbers are, you know, sort of brought to the level of Skylake, and as you can see, Skylake still outperforms Haswell in this scenario. So that's point one. Point two, actually, the real cream on top is that, as Damian said, the performance numbers here for per core should be doubled because each packet is crossing this guy twice. So these are external numbers, PPS numbers, but they, each of those packets is forwarded by the vSwitch twice. Yes. So the capability of that, yeah. it's actually nothing to do with a full duplex. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. it's, these are the externally observed packets. But each of them is passing this guy twice. So the capacity per core is double that. So that's you know, yeah. close to 21 mil PPS. And uh, bandwidth-wise, uh, for bandwidth, 73 gig. over 70 gig per cool. core. Yeah. In other words, VPP, with, and that, with sorry for, for a mistake I made before. So, so basically, the uh, VPP in this setup at one core is forwarding 72, 73 gigabits of traffic. So it performance wasn't the number one, but it's still not bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 they call it, yes, PVP, PCP, mm. yes. That's the, that's the, uh, yeah. that's the topology yeah. there, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll leave it to the last slide, Jerome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is also, you will see in the slides, so when they're published, I will not talk because we are running out of time, but we also did IPv4 test. We don't have SUSIT numbers because that scenario is not used, but the basic difference is that, that uh, here uh, we are doing a real uh, IPv4 routing on the vSwitch. So it's a basic a vRouter case. And then, finally... Final slide. Yes. Okay, so want me to cover that? So, uh, it was our opportunity to do it uh, properly because it was from scratch, clean slate, as Damian uh, described. And uh, the result is, uh, and you know, this is the slide we, we actually put together just for this event. It's safe and secure. There is a zero memory, memory copy. Uh, 
uh, on the slave side, but the memory copies it cannot be avoided if you're looking at the safe and secure. And, but the performance metrics we talked about earlier in the talk with, uh, with Ray are still there. They are very closely watched. The MPPS, the GPPS, the CPP and at IP cycles per packet instructions per cycle. And the numbers look really good. And I think we are on a good trajectory to hit the bare metal performance numbers. If we don't hit the terabit on the Skylakes, we're going to get them on the next one. Okay? I can guarantee you. And uh, because traje trajectory is now predictable. And in terms of the library, uh, they are there. They are there to use. And uh, I'm told they are easy to use. Damien? Yes, yeah, the library is there in, in, in the repo, but it can be completely used outside of VPP. It's actually, VPP is not even using that library because the VPP is using some, some uh, different coding style. We try to do the library to be very lightweight and, and written the standards using standard C uh, defines so, and types. So the, the library is, is there, it can be integrated with any other different application which wants to talk MemIF with uh, vSwitch, and that can be VPP or something else. And with that, we're done and open for questions. Sanjeev. So, uh, you, you probably didn't focus too much on what are the different ways this could be Make used. use of the whiteboard. <laughs> well, only, only that one. I'm aware of, but I'm not the container expert or Kubernetes expert, so. And yeah, another thing which I, I didn't explicitly say, but MemIF is purely a packet interface. So it's, it, it is not a stack kind of uh, interface like Florian was explaining before. So the, it, it is mainly intended for the, for the VNF kind of applications running in the containers, where you are talking with pa about packets, not about the, the sessions, right? So can it, never be can it, it was not made for to be uh, the the host stack or anything like that. It is built just to exchange packets between user mode applications. Right. Yeah. Can it ever in the future also serve host stacks? Or We're out of time, right? Yes. Well, I mean, okay. in the form like it is, it is today, no. Uh, if we can extend it, probably yes. But the question is, do, do we want to do that? We we uh, we I might we y'all yeah, we're we're like continuing to get more and more and more behind. So um, I think this is probably a good conversation, but maybe kind of you know take it off take it offline because it sounds like it it'll be good for. Um, yeah, yes, I think we are out of time for questions. Or Heather? Wait, yeah, no, we've we, we've managed to get seven more minutes behind. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, when we when we parking, and I still have a mic, I can answer the question that was uh, that was asked before uh, about the vhost user comparison. Uh, we haven't done it because we believe it would be unfair and not apples to apples on as part of uh, this talk. So we're going to have a set of tests in exactly the same conditions uh, with um, it within Sysit and uh, watch this space. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you.